in the bag. In the bag. It's something I have said a hundred times, maybe a thousand times, but it took on a total new meaning for me just two Thursdays ago. I was just about to cross the threshold of Northeast Baptist Hospital to see one of our members when I heard a voice clamoring behind me, Preacher! Oh, Preacher! And I looked behind me, and there was a large, sleek, shiny black Chrysler. The passenger window had been rolled down, and the formidable woman in the driver's seat was beckoning me. Preacher! So I ran over like a car hop at Sonic. <laughs> and she said, Preacher, would you please pray for my husband? And I said, well, yes, ma'am, I'd be glad to do that. I presume he's, he's here in the hospital. And she said, oh, no, 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 sir, no, sir. Uh, I'm a pharmaceuticals rep. Uh, he's been dead for two years. Uh, I just miss him terribly. And I said, well, I understand that, ma'am, and I'll be glad to pray for him and for you. I said, just take my hand, and, and I'll pray for both of you. She says, well, just a minute, let me get him situated. Well, at this point, <laughs> I'm looking in, I poke my head in this big old car. I'm looking for a grandson, a business partner, or even a dog. And then she gingerly takes her big black handbag and she places it on the passenger seat. And I, I look at it and I, I look at her and I go, um, <clears throat> Ma'am, is that your husband? <laughs> and she goes, yes, sir, it is. I take him everywhere I go. He goes on all my appointments, and I thought, I wonder what the doctors think about that. <laughs> you know. But, but then I had two, two very pressing thoughts, uh, and that was, number one, why did these things never happen to Scott and Rob? <laughs> <laughs> and the second was I needed to take this woman's hand and pray that she could get on with her important grieving but lose the bag but lose the bag now we chuckle about the woman um, but the truth is grieving is real grieving is real and I've learned that very powerfully in this particular community that I share with you Grieving is real. It can take a, a long time for the wounds to scab over. And grieving always leaves a scar, doesn't it? It always leaves a scar. The, the second thing uh, that we chuckle about is that we do so in defense. We do so in defense because we know we're more like the woman in the big black Chrysler than we want to admit. We're all carrying around bags of dead stuff. We're all carrying around bags of dead stuff. Even Mary Magdalene on that first Easter, you know, she races out to the garden tomb, and I guarantee you she had a bag with her. And the bag was for the dead. It had myrrh and aloe and cassia and oil of cedar and cinnamon and other spices to anoint the dead body of Jesus. That's all she wants to do. She wants to get there in time. She wants to get there now that, now that the, the Sabbath is over where she can anoint his body. But when she gets to the tomb, he's not there. And so she begins to root around in the garden looking for his, for his bloody, bruised, terribly disfigured, very dead body that's been dumped in some ditch like, like, uh, like a, a victim of a gangland murder. That's what she thinks happened to him. And so she's looking around and she becomes more and more desperate until she sees a man who is very much alive, whom she supposes is the gardener, as alive as the green things he grows. And she said, sir, just tell me where you put him and I'll take care of his body. And all it takes is one word, Mary. Mary. And she knows right then right then, that although he still bears the terrible scars, the terrible scars of his crucible, 
He has transcended the grave, and he is alive. He is very much alive. And the only thing Mary knows to do after that, the only thing she knows to do is drop the bag and race into town and say, I've seen the Lord, I've seen the Lord, which I presume she says until the day she dies. I've seen the Lord. But she had to drop the bag. I wonder, as I think about that, if we realize that this proclamation of Mary's is not just a nice novelty of the Christian faith. I think often we sort of tack on the resurrection of Jesus as sort of a, a nice thing to hold in our back pocket. And when we're getting ready to die, die, we think, okay, this is my get out of hell free card. But the resurrection means far, far, far more than that. Think about St. Paul. He was thunderstruck. He was thunderstruck as to what the resurrection meant for us now. Now. If you'll recall, in the year 55, uh, just 23 years after the resurrection of Jesus, Paul writes these words to the church at Colossa, a brand new group of Christians. He writes this. He, he says, God has rescued us. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, from the, from the clutches of darkness, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Folks, because of the resurrection, you and I have changed addresses. We have moved from death to life. And there's no going back. There's no going back. Just 10 years after that, 10 years after that, the author of Hebrews, so enraptured by, by what the resurrection means, he realized that the resurrection has an everyday effect on you and me. And so in the well-rehearsed verses of Hebrews 12, the author writes these words. He says, since we have been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses of God's saving power, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that clings to us and run with perseverance the race that's set before us. Looking, looking at Jesus who both began and finished the race we're in. For the author of Hebrews, writing in the year 65, he is just overcome with the aftershocks of the resurrection. He says, we're caught up in the aftershocks of the resurrection. Such that those things that have clinged to us, sin and those habits that just seem to trip us up at every turn, those things don't have to cling to us anymore. No, we're in a race. And we can run with perseverance this race without those things clinging to us because we can keep our eyes on the Lord who started the pilgrimage we're in and who finished it by breaking the bonds of death. The resurrection is an every day, every minute reality. It's what it is. Now, why do we persist in carrying those bags? And what kind of bags do we carry? You know, I can think of a few up close and personal. One thing we persist in carrying, carrying bags that are full of, of the deadly patterns that we find ourselves in. We've all occasionally fallen into patterns of living that leave us absolutely depleted. I mean, you might come to the end of the day and you're exhausted, but it's not from fatigue as much as it is from frustration. And you realize, as I have realized about myself, we're just not living the life God has called us to. God has called us to something much, much, much more uh, grander than the life we're living. And yet we've settled for a cycle and we don't know how to get off of the exit ramp. We seem to be in a spiral. This happened to me 11 years ago. I was... Uh, I was director of a church north of here, just in the Austin area. And the church was growing. People were happy. But the senior warden, who was a captain of industry, 
who had been the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, looked at me and said, Pat, what's going on? And I said, I do not believe I'm living the call to which God has issued me. He said, well, let's test that. He said, I want you to keep a record. I want you to keep a record of everything you do for two weeks. I mean, a careful, almost 30-minute to 30-minute record of everything you do. And at the end of two weeks, we'll look at the log and we'll see what it tells us. Sure enough, if you want to try this, sure enough, 14 days later, I saw the pattern of death I was in. Oh, sure, I was doing those things that the church expected me to do. I was, I was running the church well. I was, I, was handling it. I was handling personnel problems, maintenance issues, a 52-acre campus you can only imagine, and raising money. The church was $1,800,000 in debt. You had to raise money. Your back was against the wall. Cost us $100,000 a year in debt service. But the black and white record showed it. I had, neg I had only been studying the scripture, praying, and writing in perfunctory and very shallow ways. And for me, for the calling that I have, that was a dead-end bag of goods. And so on that very day, that was the day I started writing Bible studies. Today, I have written 500 weekly Bible studies, 250 while I've been here. I have tormented you day in and day out with all my essay writing, which I know makes good kindling for your fires, but, uh, uh, and then also I, I pray uh, every morning and every night in silence, and I set a timer on my watch to do so. I had to let go of the bag of death and turn towards life. I had to do that. Another thing we carry around is anger. We, we tote around anger that is fueled by our lack of forgiveness. Do you know that? We tote around anger that's fueled by our lack of forgiveness. And we try to be clever. And we disguise our, we disguise, disguise our lack of forgiveness in righteous indignation. And we think that's so kind of, so kind of uh, groovy. You can say I'm a child of the 60s. And yet I want you to remember, when we do that, we're like Sisyphus in Greek mythology. You know Sisyphus, he was the most clever of all of the, all the people in Greek mythology. And what did he end up doing? He ended up pushing a boulder up a hill all day, every day, only to see it tumble back down at the end of the day. That's how clever he was. He was in a mad cycle of unforgiveness. That's what will happen to you and me. Or, better put, by the most beloved personality of this church in, in the last decade, Barbara Fry. She said, to fail to forgive is like feeding yourself poison and expecting you're going to hurt the other guy. Who wants to go around with a bag of poison around their neck? Huh? Who? And thirdly, uh, the most virulent, the most virulent, um, lethal, a uh, bag of death we carry around in our rucksacks is uh, fear. We fear losing our health. We fear losing uh, our income, our substance. We fear not having enough. And we fear death. Now, the truth is, you and I are all going to become less and less ambulatory. That's going to happen. And we're going to become less astute. That's going to happen too. And guess what? Physically, you and I are going to die. That is a certainty. But if we give in to the fear of that today, if we give in to the fear of that, grasping on to all this stuff, we're already in a death spiral. We're dead before we die. That's the truth. I wondered, how do, you, how do you get beyond this? And I learned how from the most unlikely person in my life. The very most unlikely person in my life taught me how to deal with this. My mother-in-law. <laughs> now, to be clear, my mother-in-law, Edna, uh, was not pious at all. She lived in utter luxury. Kay's father was eminently successful. And she lived, she lived very comfortably while he was alive, and she had no drop-off when he died. 
And yet, as she declined and she began to carry around a, a little canister of oxygen, she gave away all of her wealth. All of it. She gave away her jewelry. She gave away her sets of china. She gave away her silver. She gave away her money. And she gave away every stick of furniture she had. At the end, the last year of her life, the kids had to bring in her yard furniture where she had some place to sit down and eat. And yet, she died the freest person I've ever seen because she knew that stuff was too heavy to be raised. It was too heavy to be raised. And so she turned toward the resurrection. I have been able to experience that this week uh, in a, a very, very powerful way. Um, all the clergy during the last couple weeks of Lent try to take Holy Communion out to all of our very sick and homebound people, whether they're wherever they are, in this nursing home or in their homes or wherever. I took, I took Eucharist to two people for for whom this would be their last Easter communion. They knew it, and I knew it. Kay and I took Holy Eucharist to a woman who had been denied the sacrament, the Holy Communion from her church, for 25 years. Yet I want to tell you that every one of those homes and every one of those nursing homes and every one of those hospital rooms the four walls reverberated with joy. They reverberated with joy. Why? Because everyone in there had their eyes turned towards life, towards the resurrection, towards Jesus who is risen. There was not a drop of sadness at all in the room. That's what can happen if we drop the bag. Now, speaking of bags, I have another bag here. This is a bag that Ali Melancon taught us about. It's called a Maggie, a, 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 a mana bag. This is, this is Ali up here. She's one of our young members. And she taught us how to pack these bags. We taught, we packed hundreds of them. There's nothing fancy in it. There's Vienna sausages, peanut butter crackers, uh, fruit, uh, uh, sort of uh, fruit mix. Um, there's toothpaste, deodorant, toothbrush, a fork, a, a track from Max Locato on, on John... 316, some water, so forth. But when Allie gave these to us, she said, if we're going to live the risen life, you have to extend the risen life. You cannot keep it to yourself. It has to be extended. And then on the very day she gave us the second batch, Pope Francis had just said, when he was asked, he was asked, did he give to those people who begged from him? And he said, every time. He said, but here's the difference. I look and speak to everyone to whom I give my substance. I look at them and I see them. So, Allie and the Pope got kind of got under my skin. Three weeks ago, I'm leaving Bible study uh, on San Pedro with all the guys, and I see a guy hiding behind a blue dumpster, a reeking, yucky blue dumpster beside a laundromat. That's about as bad as it gets. He doesn't want to be seen. He's not asking for anything, but I saw him. So I went over to him with a manna bag. And remembering what Allie told me, I made sure I looked right at him. And I handed him the bag, and he couldn't look at me. He just couldn't. But he took the bag. The next week, I took, I took him the, tr the most favorite treat in my household. Kay's favorite, most favorite treat. She likes this even better than Cheetos. I took him a big bag of peanut M&M's. I bought them especially for him, thinking I wanted to give him something I'd give my beloved. And I showed up this time, and he didn't quite look at me, but he took it. I felt like we had a little more connection. And then it was then that I realized the man could not hear, nor could he speak. He couldn't hear or speak. And then last week, I took him my favorite candy bar. I took him my favorite candy bar, and I, I just hesitated. And he took it, and he looked up at me finally, and he smiled. 
He knew that I had seen him and he had seen me and we both, we both were very much alive.